Welcome aboard. Today, we are in Cairo, Egypt. The year 2022 marks 100 years since one of the most significant archaeological discoveries in history occurred. The discovery of King Tutankhamun's tomb simply known as King Tut. Today, we will fly south from Cairo to an area known as the Valley of the Kings, and there we will find the location of the tomb. We will be passing over some of the great pyramids of Egypt, but today's story is about King Tut and the discovery of his tomb in 1922. Let me get the plane started. We will take a look at our flight plan, and then we will get underway. We had penetrated two chambers. But when we came to a golden shrine with doors closed and sealed, we realized that we were in the presence of the dead king. We were to witness a spectacle such as no other man in our time had been privileged to see. The plane is started, and here is today's flight plan. Leaving Cairo in the north here, at the International Airport, we will be flying south along the Nile River, over the Valley of the Kings, and then on to Luxor International Airport. If this is your first tour with us, what we do is we find interesting places with interesting stories, and we find them here in Microsoft Flight Simulator. We are at the Cairo International Airport, which has the airport code HECA, and it's the main international airport here in Cairo. It's the largest and busiest airport in Egypt. It has three runways. The airport is located to the northeast of Cairo, about 9 miles or 15 kilometers from the business section of the city. Today, we are flying the Cessna 172 Skyhawk. The Skyhawk is an American four-seat, single-engine, high-wing, fixed-wing aircraft made by the Cessna Aircraft Company. We have completed our taxi and we are ready for takeoff. We are airborne, and as we head south, we will be passing over a few sites of interest, the first being the Giza Pyramid Site. The Giza Pyramid Complex is a site on the Giza Plateau that includes the Great Pyramid of Giza. These pyramids were built for the Egyptian pharaohs during the fourth dynasty of the Old Kingdom of Ancient Egypt, between the years 2600 and 2500 BCE. The pyramids at this location were built for Pharaoh Khufu, his son Pharaoh Khafre, and his grandson Pharaoh Pharaoh Menkare. Pharaoh Khufu began the first Giza pyramid project around 2550 BCE. His Great Pyramid is the largest here in Giza and towers some 481 feet 147 meters above the plateau. Khufu's son, Pharaoh Khafre, built the second pyramid at Giza around 2520 BCE. His necropolis also included the Sphinx. A necropolis is a large elaborate cemetery or burial site located in an ancient city. The third of the Giza pyramids is considerably smaller than the first two and it was built by the pharaoh Menkare around 2490 BCE. The Giza site is at the edge of the western desert and it's on the west side of the Nile River near the city of Giza. For the thousands of years the Egyptian Empire existed from about 3100 BCE to 30 BCE, it seems that pyramids were only constructed for a few centuries. Unlike earlier burial sites within pyramids, later pharaohs were buried in underground burial chambers, possibly as a way to prevent grave robbery that plagued early the Egyptian tombs. The tomb of Tutankhamun is the burial place of Tutankhamun who was an ancient Egyptian pharaoh who was the 
last of his royal family to rule during the end of the 18th dynasty. He ruled from 1332 to 1323 BC during the New Kingdom, also referred to as the Egyptian Empire. Tutankhamun's father was Pharaoh Ankhenaten, and his mother was his father's sister, who was identified through DNA testing of an unknown mummy that was referred to as the Younger Lady. The Younger Lady was the informal name given to a mummy discovered in the Valley of the Kings in 1898. The tomb is in the Valley of the Kings, also known as the Valley of the Gates of the Kings, and is a valley here in Egypt where for a period of nearly 500 years, from the 16th to the 11th century BCE, rock-cut tombs were constructed for the pharaohs and powerful nobles of the New Kingdom. The valley is on the west bank of the Nile, opposite of the site of the ancient city of Thebes, which is located where the current city of Luxor is. The valley is known to contain 63 tombs and chambers. Since the 1920s, the valley has been famous for the discovery of the tomb of Tutankhamun. Tutankhamun took the throne when he was only eight or nine years old. He married his paternal half-sister, Anke Sanamun. His names, Tutankhaten and Tutankhamun, are thought to mean living image of Aten, being the disk of the sun, and then later, living image of Amun, who was a major ancient Egyptian god, Aten, replaced by Amun, after his father's death, and Tutankhamun started his reign. This may have been in part to Tutankhamun reversing his father's abandoning of the Egyptians' traditional polytheism, the belief in many gods, to Atonism, or worship centered around Aten. Aten, as I mentioned, was the disk of the sun, and originally an aspect of Re, the sun god. Tutankhamun's father, Akhenaten, was the first to practice a single god religion. There are many theories as to what killed King Tut. He was tall, but apparently a physically frail person, with crippling bone disease discovered in his clubbed left foot. He is the only pharaoh known to have been depicted seated while engaging in physical activities like archery. The tradition of inbreeding in the Egyptian royal families also likely contributed to the king's poor health and possibly his early death. DNA tests in 2010 revealed that Tutankhamun's parents were brother and sister, and that his wife, Anke Sanamun, was also his half-sister. Their two daughters were stillborn. The mummies of these two were also interned within Tutankhamun's tomb in the room known as the Treasury. Tutankhamun's tomb is smaller than other Egyptian royal tombs of its time, consisting of four chambers and an entrance staircase, and it's less extensively decorated. It is believed that it was originally built as a tomb for a non-royal individual that was later adapted to Tutankhamun after his premature death. Because Tutankhamun's remains revealed a hole in the back of his skull, some historians had concluded that the young king was assassinated, but recent tests suggest that the hole was made during mummification. CT scans in 1995 showed that the king had an infected broken left leg, while DNA from his mummy revealed evidence of multiple malaria infections, all of which may have contributed to his early death. After he died, King Tut was mummified according to Egyptian religious tradition, which held that royal bodies should be preserved and provisioned for the afterlife. Embalmers removed his organs and wrapped him in resin-soaked bandages. A 24-pound solid gold portrait mask was placed over his head and shoulders, and he was laid in a series of nested containers, three golden coffins, and a granite sarcophagus. Sarcophagus is a stone coffin, and four gilded wooden shrines, the largest of which barely fit into the tomb's burial chamber. Because of his tomb's small size, historians suggest King Tut's death must have been unexpected and his burial rushed by eye who succeeded him as pharaoh. Before his rule, I was a close advisor to two or three other pharaohs. It is believed that he was the power behind the throne during the young Tutankhamun's reign. It is suspected that the tomb that Tut was buried in was meant for I, and that with the untimely death of Tut, he used the opportunity to swap tombs to allow him the larger, but still unfinished tomb that was meant for Tut. Along with the king's body, the tomb was packed to the ceiling with more than 5,000 items to be used by the king's journey into the afterlife, including furniture, chairs, chariots, clothes, weapons, and 130 of the king's walking sticks. We are arriving at the site of the Giza Pyramid Complex that has the three pyramids as well as the Sphinx. On another tour, maybe we'll talk about the pyramids in more detail. As we head south, there are some other sites of interest we'll be passing over with pyramids, such as Saqqara, Dashur, and Maidum, but our destination today is the Valley of the Kings, where King Tut's tomb was discovered. The pharaohs who followed Tut chose to ignore his reign, despite his work restoring the original religious practices, he was tainted by the connection to his father's religious transformations in Egypt. His name was removed from all the monuments built by Tut, and within a few generations, that practice, as well as the tomb's entrance being covered by sand and stone debris and built over by workmen's huts during the construction of later tombs, Tut was pretty much a forgotten pharaoh. That would be changed by a man named Howard Carter, 
Howard Carter was born in Kensington, England on May 9, 1874, the youngest child of artist and illustrator Samuel John Carter. Howard showed talent as an artist as well. Growing up near a mansion of the Amherst family, Didlington Hall, Howard was exposed to a sizable collection of Egyptian antiques which sparked his interest in the subject. Lady Amherst was impressed by the young Howard's artistic skills. In 1891, she advocated sending Howard to assist one of her family friends, Percy Newberry, in the excavation and recording of some tombs in the Middle Kingdom at Beni Hassan. Although only 17 at the time, Howard was innovative in improving the methods of copy and tomb decorations. He would then go on to work at Armana, the capital founded by the pharaoh Akhenaten, as well as other significant archaeological excavation sites. In 1899, Howard was appointed Inspector of Monuments for Upper Egypt in the Egyptian Antiquities Service based in Luxor. He oversaw a number of excavations and restorations at the site of the ancient city of Thebes. While in the nearby Valley of the Kings, he supervised the exploration of the valley by the American archaeologist Theodore Davis. In 1904, after a dispute with locals over tomb thefts, he was transferred to the Inspectorate of Lower Egypt. Howard Carter was praised for his improvements in the protection of and accessibility to existing excavation sites in his development of the grid block system for searching for tombs. The Antiquities Service also provided funding for Howard to head his own excavation projects. He resigned from the Antiquities Service in 1905 after a formal inquiry into what became known as the Saqqara Affair, a violent confrontation between Egyptian sight guards and a group of French tourists. Carter sided with the Egyptian personnel, refusing to apologize when the French authorities made an official complaint. Moving back to Luxor, Howard was without formal employment for nearly three years. He made a living by painting and selling watercolors to tourists. In 1907, Howard was hired by a wealthy aristocrat, George Herbert, who was the fifth Lord of Carnarvon. Lord Carnarvon had Howard Carter lead a team to search for and excavate Egyptian nobles' tombs. Lord Carnarvon received a license in 1914 to dig at the site where it was believed that King Tutankhamun's tomb was located. He gave the job to Carter Howard. Howard assembled a team to help with the excavation, but was interrupted by World War I. During the First World War, Howard spent his years working as a diplomatic courier and translator. He translated clandestine messages between French and British officials in their Arab contacts. He finally began his excavation work towards the end of 1917. Lord Carnarvon grew dissatisfied with the lack of findings over the years of archaeological searches, and in 1921 he decided to fund one final year of searching. On November 4th, 1922, within just days of that year's work beginning, they uncovered a stone that turned out to be the top step of a flight of stairs cut into the bedrock. Howard and his crew investigated further. The top of the stairs was partially dug out and a doorway was found. The door was stamped with a cartouche, which are ovals or oblongs enclosing a group of Egyptian hieroglyphics, often containing the name and the title of royal monarchs. This would become the first tomb of its significance that had been left untouched for over 3,000 years. Several other tombs in the Valley of the Kings had laid open from ancient times onward, and the entrances to others remained hidden until after the emergence of Egyptology in the early 19th century. Many of the remaining tombs were found by a series of excavators working for Theodore Davis from 1902 to 1914. Under Davis, most of the valley was explored, although he never found Tutankhamun's tomb. Among his discoveries was a pit containing objects bearing Tutankhamun's name. These objects are thought to have been either burial goods or objects related to Tutankhamun's funeral. Theodore David's excavation also discovered a small tomb that contained pieces of a chariot harness bearing the name of Tutankhamun and I. He was convinced that that was the tomb of Tutankhamun, leading some archaeologists to believe that King Tut's tomb had already been found. It was after Theodore gave up work in the valley that the archaeologist Howard Carter and his financer and partner Lord Carnarvon made an effort to clear the valley of debris down to the bedrock. Theodore Davis's finds of artifacts bearing Tutankhamun's name gave them a reason to believe they might find his tomb, and that discovery became a reality on November 4th, 1922, with that single step discovered at the top of that staircase. According to Howard Carter's published accounts, the workmen discovered the step while digging beneath the remains of some huts, although other accounts attribute the discovery to a boy digging outside the assigned work area. The step proved to be the beginning of a tomb entrance staircase. At the bottom stood a sealed doorway into which Howard Carter cut a peephole to see the passage beyond was filled with rubble. Carter sent a telegram to Lord Carnarvon, who was at the time back in England. He had the men refill the hole they dug so as to secure the tomb entrance until Lord Carnarvon's return. On November 23rd, Lord Carnarvon arrived in Luxor with his daughter, Lady Evelyn.
and Herbert, and the digging resumed. The doorway looked as if it had been partially damaged at some point and then resealed, indicating that the tomb may have been robbed, most likely in ancient times. Lord Carnarvon and Howard Carter breached the first of the sealed tomb doors and entered into the outer passage of the tomb on November 26, 1922. From the passageway, after clearing it of stone and rubble, the group encountered the second sealed door. Howard Carter made a small hole through this door. In his book, Howard Carter described the event. With trembling hands, I made a tiny breach in the upper left-hand corner darkness and blank space as far as the iron testing rod could reach. It showed what whatever lay beyond was empty and not filled like the passage we had just cleared. Candle tests were applied as a precaution against possible foul gases and then, widening the hole a little bit, I inserted the candle and peered in. Lord Carnarvon, Lady Evelyn, and Arthur Callender, Carter's assistant, standing anxiously beside me to hear the verdict. At first I could see nothing, the hot air escaping from the chamber, causing the candle flame to flicker. But presently, as my eyes grew accustomed to the light, details of the room within emerged slowly from the mist. Strange animals, statues, and gold. Everywhere the glint of gold. Lord Carnarvon asked Howard Carter whether he could see anything, and Howard replied, yes, wonderful things. What Howard was looking into now is known as the antechamber. The antechamber is the first room that can be entered when walking into King Tutankhamun's tomb. The chamber is the main hub and all the other rooms can only be accessed through this chamber. This room alone contained burial goods in a greater quantity than the excavators could have ever hoped for. Some were objects that were very familiar from previous finds, some were exceptionally elaborate examples of their kind, and some were entirely unexpected. From the antechamber led two doorways that had been blocked with plaster and then breached by ancient grave robbers. One was left open, revealing the chamber beyond, dubbed the Annex. It was filled with a chaotic jumble of objects. The other had been resealed in ancient times. Many of the objects bore Tutankhamun's name, leaving the excavators with no doubt that this was his tomb. At some point in the days after first peering into and entering the antechamber, the excavators breached the plaster of the blocked doorway. Howard Carter, Lord Carnarvon, and Lady Herbert had squeezed through the hole to find the tomb's burial chamber, which was mostly filled by a set of gilded shrines that enclosed Tutankhamun's sarcophagus, the stone coffin. The robbers apparently had gone no further than the outermost rooms. Carter may have wanted to be certain that the robbers had not reached the burial site since in 1900 he had opened what he had thought was an undisturbed royal tomb in front of many important guests only to find it nearly empty. Reaching the doorway before the tomb had been inspected by the antiquity service was not explicitly against the terms of Lord Carnarvon's permit but it was an irregular act. The team resealed the hole with new plaster although their breach of the doorway became something of an open secret in the Egyptian archaeological community. Clearing the tomb of its artifacts would require an unprecedented effort. Moisture from floods in the valley valley above had periodically seeped into the tomb over the centuries. As a result, alternating periods of humidity and dryness had warped wood, dissolved glue, and caused leather and textiles to decay. Every exposed surface was covered with an unidentified film. Howard needed assistance. He sought help from Albert Lithgow of the New York's Metropolitan Museum's Egyptian excavation team, who readily agreed to loan him a number of his staff. Assisting him would be Arthur Mace, a conservation specialist, Harry Burton, who was regarded as the best archaeological photographer in Egypt, Howard Carter realized that the first impressing need was photography, for nothing could be touched until a complete photographic record had been made, a task involving technical skill of the highest order. Also helping would be architect Walter Hauser and artist Lindsley Hall, who together drew the plans of the tomb. Other experts who volunteered their services were Alfred Lucas, a chemist for the Antiquity Service, whose expertise would be a great help in the conservation effort, James Breasted and Alan Gar Gardner, two of the foremost scholars of the Egyptian language of the time, who would translate any text discovered in the tomb. Also, Percy Newberry, a specialist on botanical specimens, and his wife Essie, who helped conserve textiles from the burial. There were four Egyptian foremen, Ahmed Gagar, Gad Hassan, Hussein Abu Awad, and Hussein Ahmed Said, who also worked in the tomb, and a handful of Egyptian porters, whose names were not recorded, but helped carry the object from Tutankhamun's tomb to a nearby tomb, identified as KV-15, that would be used as a work area for the excavation. Tomb KV-15 was used for the burial of Pharaoh Seti II, and the tomb had been cleared by Howard in 1904. We are now approaching the Valley of the Kings, it's the location of King Tut's tomb. King Tutankhamun's tomb is KV-62, and it's located right next to Ramses VI, which is KV-9. 
Once the tomb of King Tut was reopened on December 16th, the excavators began clearing the antechamber. Objects were labeled with reference numbers and photographed before being moved. Upon removal from the tomb, the objects were cleaned and if necessary, treated with preservatives. The contents of the tomb are by far the most complete example of a royal set of burial goods in the Valley of the Kings. They numbered 5,398 objects. Some classes of objects numbered in the hundreds. There were 413 figurines and more than 200 pieces of jewelry. Objects were present in all four chambers of the tomb as well as the corridor. The antechamber contained 600 to 700 objects. On its west side, it was taken up mostly by a tangled pile of furniture mixed with some miscellaneous small objects such as baskets of fruit and boxes of meat. Several dismantled chariots took up the southeast corner, while the northeast contained a collection of funerary bouquets, and the north end of the chamber was dominated by two life-size statues of Tutankhamun that flanked the entrance to the burial chamber. Among the significant Significant objects in the antechamber were several funeral beds with animal heads and a painted box depicting Tutankhamun in battle. Boxes in the antechamber contained most of the clothing in the tomb, including tunics, shirts, kilts, gloves, and sandals, as well as cosmetics. The annex contained more than 2,000 individual artifacts, including beds, stools, and stone and pottery vessels containing wines and oils. The room housed most of the tomb's foodstuffs and much of the weaponry, such as bows, throwing sticks, and kopesh swords, which is an Egyptian sickle-shaped sword. Other objects in the annex were personal possessions that Tutankhamun seemingly used as a child, such as toys, a box of paints, and a fire lighting kit. Most of the space in the burial chamber was taken up by the sarcophagus and the four gilded wooden shrines that enclosed it. Yet, even this chamber contained burial items including jars, religious objects, oars, fans, and walking sticks. From the burial chamber, you enter the treasury. In the doorway of the treasury stood a shrine on carrying poles topped by a statue of the jackal god Anubis. Against the east wall of the treasury was a tall gilded shrine containing the canopic chest in which Tutankhamun's internal organs were placed after mummification. Between the Anubis shrine and the canopic shrine stood a wooden sculpture of a cow's head representing the goddess Hathor. Hathor is an ancient Egyptian goddess of fertility, motherhood, and music, often depicted as a woman with the head or the horns of a cow. Boxes in the treasury contained miscellaneous items, including much of the tomb's jewelry. A nested set of small coffins in the treasury contained a lock of hair belonging to Tai, the wife of Amenhotep III. She was the mother of Akhenaten and grandmother of Tutankhamun. In 2010, DNA analysis confirmed her as the mummy known as the Elder Lady, found in the tomb of Amenhotep III in 1898. One box contained two miniature coffins in which Tutankhamun's stillborn daughters were interred. The recording of the tomb's contents and conserving them so they could be transported to Cairo proved to be an unprecedented task lasting for 10 10 digging seasons. The excavators finally opened and removed Tutankhamun's coffin and mummy in 1925, then spent the next few seasons working on the treasury and the annex. The clearance of the tomb itself was completed in November of 1930, although Howard and Alfred Lucas continued to work on conserving the remaining burial goods until February of 1932, when the last shipment was sent to Cairo. Now let's head to our final destination, the Luxor International Airport. The price of today's tour is pretty reasonable. Reasonable. If you could just reach down and hit that subscribe button, it helps the channel and I really do appreciate it. The spectacular nature of the tomb's contents inspired a media frenzy dubbed Tutmania, and it made Tutankhamun into one of the most famous pharaohs, often known by his nickname King Tut. The publicity increased when Lord Carnarvon died of an infection in April of 1923, inspiring rumors that he had been killed by a curse on the tomb. Other deaths and strange events connected with the tomb came to be attributed to this curse as well. On March 19th of 1923, Lord Carnarvon suffered a severe mosquito bite, and that became infected by a razor cut. On April 5th, he died in the Continental Savoy Hotel in Cairo, caused, according to reports, by blood poisoning that progressed into pneumonia. Prior to Lord Carnarvon's death, Howard Carter's Yellow Canary died under strange circumstances. Carter had bought the canary in the gilded cage with the idea that the songbird would cheer up his lonely house. The death of the canary at this time was seen as a bad omen. Here is an account of what happened to the canary from the report of the Inspector General in charge of antiquities. During the recent excavation, which led to the discovery of the tomb of Tutankhamun, Mr. Howard Carter, the discoverer, had in his house a canary, which daily regaled him with a happy song. On the day, however, on which the entrance into the tomb was laid bare, a cobra entered the house 
pounced on the bird and swallowed it. Now, cobras are rare in Egypt and are seldom seen in the winter, but in ancient times they were regarded as the symbol of royalty, and each pharaoh wore the symbol upon his forehead, as though to signify his power to strike and sting his enemies. Well, curse or no curse, as I mentioned, the clearance of the tomb itself was completed in November of 1930, and Howard Carter and Alfred Lucas continued to work on the conservation and the remaining burial goods until February 1932, and that's when the last shipment was sent to Cairo. In 2022, the Grand Egyptian Museum will also open. It's an archaeological museum in Giza, Egypt. The main exhibit at this museum will be the full tomb collection of King Tutankhamun, over 5,000 objects. That was a bit about the Valley of the Kings here in Egypt and how King Tut's tomb was discovered. In a dead silence, the huge lid, weighing over a ton and a quarter, was raised from its bed. Light shone into the sarcophagus. But how disappointing, the contents were completely covered by linen shrouds. But as the last shroud was rolled back, a gasp of wonderment escaped our lips. So gorgeous was the sight that met our eyes. A golden effigy of the young king of magnificent workmanship filled the whole of the interior. This was but the lid of a series of three coffins nested one within the other, enclosing the mortal remains of the young king Tutankhamun. Welcome to Luxor, a city in Upper Egypt that includes the site of the ancient Egyptian city of Thebes. And why is it called Upper Egypt since we just flew south today, you may ask? It derives from the direction or the flow of the Nile River, which flows from the highlands of East Africa northwards to the Mediterranean Sea. Upper Egypt is in the south and Lower Egypt is in the north. The Luxor International Airport has the code HELX and is the main airport serving the city of Luxor here in Egypt. It's located four miles or six kilometers east of the city, and it's a popular tourist destination for those visiting the Valley of the Kings. Let's find a place to park the plane and we'll take a look around the airport. Mm -hmm. 